This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, January 8th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, a record high in COVID-19 cases elevates health professionals' concerns over an already stressed hospital system. Then the chair of the the House Homeland Security Committee reflects on the storming of the Capitol earlier this week. Plus, the latest State of the State survey reveals a drop in the governor's approval rating. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi has a new high record in daily coronavirus cases. This comes as the Department of Health reports 3,255 new cases of COVID-19 yesterday, showing signs of a surge that health officials predicted would follow the holiday season. Dr. Mark Horn is president of the Mississippi State Medical Association. Horn tells our Kobe Vance he feels as if residents have grown numb to the high numbers. When you look back over the past seven to 10 days, you see that we have a steady increase in number of cases on average. Bottom line is, it's bad. What does it mean for the state of Mississippi? Well, it means that we're not uh, getting better. We're getting worse. It means that each of those cases, we know that about 10% of the people who test positive will end up in a hospital. So that means that it means that on average, Today's numbers will generate uh, just over uh, 3,000, uh, just over 300 uh, hospitalizations. We know that of the people that get hospitalized, uh, we know about 20% of those people end up in ICUs. We know that a certain number of those people are going to die. So it tells us bad things about the coming days and weeks. And um, we, we've become, I think the average person in the public has become somewhat numbed to the numbers. Uh, and that those 3,000-plus names are real people. They're individuals, and I talked to a lot of them. I've, I've been looking at some charts right before we spoke. It scares people. Once once it becomes real to them, they're often concerned. Well, am I going to be one of those people who ends up in the hospital? Am I going to be someone who's going to end up on the ventilator? Am I going to be some, that, that statistic that doesn't make it? or that has long-term consequences that last for weeks or months. Um, That's what those numbers mean to me. Those numbers are people, not just numbers. Some hospitals are having to take on patients, um, even if they don't have space, uh, in an effort to try to relieve some of the strain off of the state's largest hospitals um, because ICU rooms are often full and uh, managing that managing these transfers is often difficult. What have have you been hearing on that on that field? I would say that hospitals across the state, I haven't polled all of them, but I would suspect that the vast majority, if not all of the hospitals in the state that manage intensive care unit patients have more ICU patients than they have ICU beds or ICU staff to care for. I know that there are facilities where we're having to place two patients per ICU room in order to care for people. Um, it's common, common, common across the state. Uh, I would say it's the rule, not the exception, to be holding many patients in the emergency room that simply do not have a place to go in the hospital. And it depends on the size of the facility, but the larger facilities have sometimes held dozens of patients, dozens, uh, in their ERs for extended periods of time. I had some a friend of mine uh, tell me yesterday that at his facility um, in the central part of the state that uh, ambulances were being told not to unload their patients, to care for the patients in the ambulance for several hours, at, at one case up to five hours before they could have a place to unload them in the ER. So 
you know, it, it's terrible. And this is the this is the rule, not the exception. These aren't rare things. You, you don't have to search very hard or talk to many physicians that work in hospitals. You'll hear these stories. You talk to a hospitalist, you talk to an ER physician, you talk to a chief medical officer, you talk to a chief executive officer of a hospital, a chief nursing officer, somebody who's got their finger on the pulse of what's going on. And um, to those of us in the profession, I mean, it's enough to curl your hair. So what do you see as the next step to try to protect our hospitals, to protect um, our health care system and make sure that at least the people who are in the most critical care can get the care they need? We, I mean, I continue to say, uh, I sound like a broken record, but I continue to plead with the public to please believe us when we tell you how bad things are. I, I, I have uh, several disappointing conversations per week with people that I know are honest, good-hearted people trying that, that typically are, are trying to do the right thing, and they just don't believe what we tell them. They genuinely do not believe this is an issue, and they cannot be convinced. And so my, my consistent plea with them is to please believe the people that you know and trust in health care. When we tell you this is a crisis, it's a crisis. And help us by wearing a mask if you're in public. I know some people don't believe they work. You know, those of us in medicine and public health, we know they work. It's not a big deal. Just put a mask on. It's not a big deal. It's not going to hurt you. It helps a little bit. It helps. It's better than not. We want to help Mississippians be healthier. We want to help them when they need us. But um, we are facing challenges that none of us could have imagined. Dr. Mark Horn is president of the Mississippi State Medical Association. Dr. Horn, thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. Coming up, the chair of the House Homeland Security Committee reflects on the storming of the Capitol earlier this week. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio. Or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. This week, pro-Trump extremists stormed the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., During the insurrection, lawmakers in the House and Senate chambers were first placed under lockdown and then evacuated to a number of undisclosed places. Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson was in the House gallery when the events began. Thompson shares his experience with our Michael Guidry and says he's joining in the House's effort to impeach President Donald Trump. At the beginning uh, of the process, uh, we saw the vice president being whisked away uh, from the uh, speaker's rostrum and other people likewise being whisked away. And we were not quite sure what was happening at that point, but we were told that the uh, Capitol uh, facility had been breached by the Trump demonstrators and so that we should just shelter in place. And then we heard uh, what we thought was gunfire uh, going uh, on. And so at that point, uh, security said, uh, put your gas mask on. Tear gas has been uh, deployed in the building. So in the midst of that, uh, a decision was made to move the members uh, assembled out of the building altogether and and it for about 30 minutes it was uh, a harrowing experience and, but we did not know until that point that the individuals who had breached the capitol had gotten to the third floor nonetheless uh, we were uh, escorted out of the building to a more secure place but uh, the fact that uh, what had been one of the more secure buildings uh, in Washington could be 
just damaged uh, uh, to the point that windows were broken, doors were smashed, uh, artifacts were taken. It was just uh, not who we are as a nation, and the whole world looked at us and said, I can't believe that the strongest government, the most democratic government, has come to this. Since the events of, of the 6th, of January 6th, images of the summer protests against racial injustice that took place in D.C. have surfaced. Uh, those images show a, a very heavily protected capital, a very strong security presence. We all know about the incident in Lafayette Park uh, during those protests where, where protesters were hastily and, and, and violently cleared out of the way. How do you explain the, the stark contrast between what we saw this summer in D.C. And, and what we saw this week? Well, it's a double standard. Uh, what we saw this summer in, in the District of Columbia, the only difference is the focus uh, was on the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, there were black and white uh, people uh, advocating uh, for racial justice and other things, and obviously the Trump administration uh, didn't like it. We had a number of federal law enforcement-related agencies there on hand. None of those assets uh, were available when this started. And the problem with it more than that is the fact that uh, we are concerned that this could have been uh, a, a more horrendous situation than what we had. More lives could have been lost. More people could have been hurt. But thank goodness it wasn't. But that breach should have never occurred. Uh, there should have been enough assets in the region. Uh, and it wasn't like this was an activity that was planned overnight. It was planned shortly after uh, the November election. Uh, President Trump tweeted, come to Washington on January 6th. It's going to be wild. And ultimately, he gave a speech uh, to that effect and told the people, go to the Capitol and, and take back your government. I never thought in my lifetime that I'd see the commander-in-chief attack his own government for exercising the democratic principles of voting. You know, since the events of, of Wednesday, we have seen some of your colleagues um, in the House and then some of your, you know, your, your counterparts in the Senate uh, suggest either the 25th Amendment be uh, invoked or that articles of impeachment be drawn up. Based on your position and your observations, uh, what is the appropriate next step uh, in, in, in addressing the, the rhetoric and the vitriol that led to this moment? Well, January 20th, uh, Donald Trump uh, will no longer be president. Thank goodness for that. Uh, I have signed on to an impeachment resolution, however. Uh, he cannot uh, get away with uh, uh, these, what I consider, treasonous actions on his part. He has demonstrated he is not fit uh, to be president of the United States. And even though we have less than two weeks left before he's gone, uh, you still have to acknowledge the fact that he continues to uh, be willful and, and neglectful of his sworn duties as president. You are the committee chairman for the House Committee on Homeland Security. Uh, what role do you see your committee having? Uh, I know Congress has uh, essentially adjourned its its regular business, but what role will your committee have in both investigating the, the events of this week and looking forward to protection of the inaugural activities on January 20th? Well, two things. Uh, domestic terrorism uh, comes under the auspices of the Homeland Security Committee, which I chair. Uh, this uh, event that occurred was an act of domestic terrorism. So we are going to have to look at it. Uh, we have to talk to the Capitol Police. We have to see uh, where the breakdowns occurred. 
uh, I have a briefing uh, set up by the FBI and Secret Service uh, on the 14th uh, of this month to look at uh, the security protocols for inauguration. Uh, it's obvious now that there are some really crazy folk in this country that bears watching. So I want to hear from the uh, agency professionals uh, what they plan to do. But I'm excited about the Biden administration coming in. He he has the experience. He has a wonderful vice president to work uh, on the team with him, with uh, uh, Vice President Harris. So it's time for us to take that deep breath uh, uh, when Trump is gone, uh, which is basically, in my estimation, is a sigh of relief. Democrat Benny Thompson, the congressman from Mississippi's second district, we thank you so much, uh, and we wish you your safety, sir. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. MPB News requested conversations and comments from the rest of Mississippi's delegation. All either declined or didn't respond to our requests. Coming up, the latest State of the State survey reveals a drop in the governor's approval rating. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. For this new year, let's ditch the New Year's resolutions. On average, they only last about 30 days. Instead, let's commit to learn something new each and every day right here on MPB Think Radio. From health to finance and even Fido, MPB Think Radio is your daily source for news, information, and entertainment. So let's make this a year to remember with MPB Think Radio, where Mississippi is our mission. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. A new poll suggests Mississippians largely disapprove of the job Governor Tate Reeves has done in his first year in office. The latest State of the State survey conducted by Millsaps College and Chisholm Strategies reveals a 49 percent disapproval rating for Reeves. Nathan Schrader is chair of the Department of Government and Politics at Millsaps. In part two of his conversation with MPB's Michael Guidry, Schrader breaks down the governor's approval marks and examines how the state's voters feel about voting expansion. What we see here is the voters have really soured on Tate Reeves in the first year. Um, there are certain, if we again drill down into the data, we find that there are certain age, certain voters, subsets of voters, that are particularly frustrated with Governor Reeves. Those are the younger voters, those who are, you know, 18 years old to 34 years old, and to a lesser extent, middle-aged voters, those who are about 35 to 54. And those who, but he he's do, he does a lot better with voters who are slightly older. He does a lot better with voters who are Republican. Uh, he does a lot better with voters who are identified as conservative. So that that's really where he he's doing. The people who are much more likely to say that they approve of his first year, his his work as governor here at the end of his first year in that office, tend to be conservative Republicans who are 65 and older. And you, if you want to see where he, he has, a, you know, especially uh, rough numbers, it's with African American voters. He's at a negative forty nine uh, uh, score with African American voters. And similarly, whether you're talking about moderate voters, it's negative forty seven. Liberal voters, negative sixty one. He he's got a lot of work to do to try to bring those people back into the fold and give them a reason to trust him or to think that he he can do the job he was elected to do. We also, in the State of the State survey, measure these questions based upon where people live in the state, in the congressional districts in which they live. The Governor Reeves has a negative rating somewhere in all those districts between negative 11 and negative 17. And, and what, why that's important is we're talking about even the conservative white majority, Republican majority congressional districts. He's hemorrhaging support if we're just looking at the approval, disapproval number, that even in these conservative Republican majority congressional districts, he's deeply underwater. Pulling the lens out and and considering the the, the presidential election and some of the 
the rhetoric surrounding the the results of that. There is the talk of voter integrity, election integrity, voter fraud, you know, those those questions. The state of the state does poll um, Mississippi residents on how they feel about early voting um, or or other voting measures. Uh, what did you find about the way Mississippians feel regarding yeah. changes in the election process? Well, well, first of all, Mississippians have in, in our pre- we have polled the, the question of early voting expansion in Mississippi three times now: in the summer of 2018, in the winter of 2019, and now in the winter of 2021. In each of these surveys, uh, the majority of Mississippi voters, not just we're not talking about a plurality of them, but a majority of Mississippi voters have outright favored the expansion of early voting in Mississippi. That is still true now. Um, 55 percent of Mississippians support um, they support allowing early voting in Mississippi, which we do not have presently. We're one of the only I believe that uh, we're one of the only six states in the country with no uh, means of doing any form of early voting. So M- Mississippians are are ready to do that. And that, that however, there's been slippage in just how many Mississippians favor that position. Um, like I said. There's only six remaining states in the nation that do not have legal early voting. We're one of those states. This number uh, was as high as 71 percent back in January 2019. Two years later, it slipped to 55 percent, but still a very, very clear majority of Mississippians, um, you know, by 17 percent, they they, they favor uh, expanding early voting in Mississippi. And I'll tell you why I believe that's the case. I think it's the fact that we have. You know, we have uh, the, the vast majority of states in the, in the country doing this, and people know this. They see their friends and family and uh, social media contacts on Facebook and other places. You know, look how, you know, I, I got early, but we do early voting. It's easy, it's safe, it's convenient. Our votes are counted. And Mississippians, I think, wonder why we're not doing that, too. And there, there's actually you know, strong pockets of support of, of for, the, for expanding early voting. Uh, among African American voters, men and women alike, every single age group of voters um, show that, that we break down in the survey. Every age range favors expanding early voting. Democrats, independents, liberals, moderates. The the only two places where there's opposition comes from conservative and conservatives and Republicans. Again, not all of them, but just slightly more conservatives and Republicans oppose this than do others politically. You mentioned the three times you've you've asked this question, there has been a majority response for support uh, for early for yeah. early, early voting, and the highest was in January of 2019 when that number was as high as 71 percent of of voters that That's you right. polled supported it. Uh, we've seen a 16 point swing as a pollster when you look at these things and you you try to contextualize them. Uh, how much of that that drop? has to do with some of the rhetoric surrounding the most recent election and the role of expanded voting and mail-in voting during that election? Oh, that, that's a terrific question. And I think you're exactly on the right, you're on the right track there. If you look at, at, in our Mississippi numbers from the state of the state survey, where is the opposition coming from for early voting expansion? It's your strong Republicans and your conserv- your most conservative voters. So with that said, where are those folks just again i'm not say, saying anything uh that, that's out of the ordinary here is where do many of those individuals get their information it tends to be some of these ultra conservative news sources and it tends to be from the twitter feed of the president of the united states and we and unfortunately as much as i hate to say this those those entities that i mentioned the president's twitter feed and some of these news organizations they have been promoting a steady diet of unhealthy misinformation about early voting and voter fraud voter fraud that did not happen in this election. So, so unfortunately, some of the individuals who I think they're, they're, they're driving that, what you mentioned, that 16-point swing away from early voting in the last two years, I believe that's coming from a very specific segment of the electorate. I don't believe it. I know it because we have the numbers. It's coming from a very specific segment of the electorate, and I would say that that's because of where they're getting their information and what that information is telling them that happens to be false. Dr. Nathan Schrader is the chair of the Department of Government and Politics at Millsaps College, uh, who conducts this State of the State survey with Chisholm Strategies. Nathan, thank you so much. We appreciate it. 
Oh, no, it, thank you. Anytime I'm happy to do this and to talk to your audience, and hopefully this will be available on the Millsaps website, millsaps.edu, very shortly. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.